you may have to get off and correct them. Doubtless, everyone in here is a fantastic parent and no one needs this. But I would be willing to bet, based on the fact that they are now giving limitless data to anyone with a device, that our issue is not that we spend too much time paying attention to our children. But this is a gospel issue. And if God child-proofed the garden, there would be no human beings leaving the garden. There would be no death for their sins, no glorification to be like Christ, and no heaven for anyone in this room. This is a gospel-related issue. And now that I have all of my time elapsed, let me give you one last issue. Gender identity. You see, if we're going to go with the Bible on all of these historical points, you like everything I've said so far, at least most of you do. At least your faces say you do. Some of you say, I have joy. Leave me alone. I have joy. <laughs> Tell your face. Tell your face you have joy. Quickly, I have three all together. I'm going to give you two real quick. Three issues of gender identity as it applies to the Bible-wide gospel. Number one, women were created separately from men. Genesis 1.27 says they were made male and female. Hang out with me for a minute. They were made male and female, and they were identified as male and female by the process that they were then supposed to carry on. What was it, you might ask? Well, without getting too graphic, you might notice in verse 27, 28 rather, that they were supposed to reproduce. I want you to be fully persuaded in your mind. I don't care how you are educated. I don't care how much you are pressured. I want you to be fully persuaded in your mind that gender is physiology-based, not psychology-based. There is no room for debate here. If you accept the historicity of man, if you accept the historicity of Adam, if you believe there's objective good and bad, if you believe the rest is sanctified, if you believe work is holy, if you believe God gave you children to raise, then you must also side with Scripture on this issue. We don't maim a body to match a healthy mind. We assume that the mind is not healthy and bend it by being renewed in the image of Christ to match the healthy body. The second issue is women are to be married to men and men are to be married to women. I cannot believe I have to say this in church. But did you know that there are Baptist churches in Hickory that are not clear on this? Baptist churches across the lake over there in Bethlehem that are not clear on this. Through Bethlehem, on the way out there, you just figure it out. There are Baptist churches that haven't figured out what God thinks about this. Now, we're not angry at people that are confused with gender dysphoria or what we might call a problem with their unrenewed mind that all of us are subject to before conversion and without the Holy Spirit filling. Do I still have you? We're not trying to pick fights with them if they're struggling with it. I suspect there's people in this room struggling with gender identity and I don't want you feeling like that the chorus of amens to my preaching means that we hate you we certainly do not hate you but we start from a place where there is objective truth and it is found between the covers of this leather bound Bible we do believe that God has spoken on this issue and we will meet with you and help you and stay with you you will not be churched if you're struggling with same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria. We will not abandon you. We do not believe you're second rate, but we do believe God has been clear. And in Genesis chapter number two, I'll show you why we know God is clear that men marry women and women marry men. It's very simple. Please notice in chapter two, verse 21, he makes a woman for Adam. And in verse 23, Adam says that this woman was taken out of man. Please notice verse 24, two statements I want you to get so you can see this. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That word joined is a sexual term. It is the... <laughs> Anyways, I don't want anyone getting nervous, uh, so, so I'll move quickly. But you see in verse 25, we know this is the case because they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. 
We have, on the one hand, in chapter 1, a command to reproduce. God calls these people who get together to reproduce married, husband and wife. They're supposed to be together and join with one another, a euphemism for sexual relations. And it so happens that worked fine because they were both naked and unashamed. Friends, God is not confused. You cannot have this kind of marital bond, read between the lines, you cannot have this kind of physiological marital bond between two men. They already saw your car in the parking lot. You might as well say amen. You can't have two women forming this kind of marital bond. It is only physiologically possible for a man and a woman to have this marriage bond. So when North Carolina legalized it, I'm talking about a law much higher than North Carolina's. So thirdly and lastly, and this is really where the rubber meets the road, the plow meets the corn, whatever I'm supposed to say. And here it is. It's going to get crazy. Y'all ready? Come on, hurry up. The roast is burning. Chapter 2, look at verse 20. Adam gave names to all cattle, birds of the air, every beast of the field. Now look at this. This is almost one of the funniest phrases. He names the giraffe. Yeah, that's a nice giraffe. <laughs> I noticed there's two of them. Names the hippopotamus. Notice there's two of them. I don't want to say they're cute. He sees two cows. He was running out of creativity. Cow. <laughs> Names all the animals. Dog. I understand it was in Hebrew. Just relax. But then it says in the end of verse 20, he didn't see two of him. I need another one of me. There's none comparable to him, nothing like him. So here's God's fix. And remember, we already learned in chapter 1, verse 27, that this happens on day 6. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from him, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, please notice what God said in verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Even if you have a King James, it says help meet. Not help mate. That is, for some reason, creeping into our church language. That's not anywhere in the Bible. Help meet. M-E-E-T. M-E-E-T. Just two, two, two E's. Meet. That means that she is comparable. She is suitable. She is, and God doesn't pull, doesn't pull the material for the first woman out of the foot or out of the head, but out of the side. She's supposed to be beside him. He's supposed to be beside her as her chief protector, and she is supposed to help him. Here we are on the last stretch. Sorry for whatever lunch I'm making you late for. I've got to finish this thought. The reality is when it comes to gender identity, this is of utmost importance, and brothers and sisters, this, this is how we are now two miles away from the ideal. This is how we are just two miles, two miles. How many have, how many have we traveled? Why is it we have a man who's been given a mission from God and he is provided a helper to make it happen? Y'all with me still? You might notice we have an ideal for work. We have an ideal for gender identity. We have an ideal for rest. We have an ideal for good and evil. We have an ideal for how man is supposed to be viewed, men and women as mankind. But here we have God's ideal for what a home is supposed to look like. One mission and a chief helper. But Pastor Bill, that is stupid. This is why I keep saying you're a cultist. No, friends, we've just traveled 100 miles. Why don't men love their wives like they should? And why don't women respect their husbands like they should? Well, I've got a few ideas. Here they go. Number one, leadership is just very hard. My job as a leader doesn't usually lend itself to domestic help. I have to work hard to get my wife to help me with what I do every day. And that's why a lot of you, friends, you're a little amazed that my wife is with me so much. That is by design. She used to be helping me. Some wonder why, if, if I'm a lady, I come forward, I notice that you have your wife come up. Why is that? Because she is my helper. 
not my little helper. No, no, that's not what I mean. Don't desecrate biblical language. But let's be honest, today, we don't really have to do this. I don't have to train someone in my home, whether it's my wife or my children. They can go do their own little things in their own little rooms and their own little layers of the house, and I can kind of keep to myself and do what I want. I don't have to train anybody. I don't have to speak. God knows I've already used up all my words by lunchtime. I don't want to come into my house and talk. I don't have to feel anything, and no one's going to make me feel bad for not training my family, not speaking to my family, and not feeling anything around my family. And what is the result today, friends? We have a result where men are so dog-tired that when they get home, frankly, you know, brothers and sisters, it is hard to get a man to speak. It's hard to get him to feel much of anything. He wants time to depress, right? How did we get here? A mile at a time. We have to actually decide that we're going to be filled with the Spirit, walk in the will of God, and we're going to decide that though I might not be able to get too close to God's ideal, I'm I'm going to try. I want to at least know why things are difficult in the Christian homes today. If I don't want to develop leaders in my home that aid me in my mission, I don't have to do so. And nobody at the workplace, and it's getting to the point where nobody at the church will say anything. I can be selfish, and I can have endless hobbies. Another reason why this isn't very positive or fun is because vision casting is very hard. I have to do it for Pastor Zach. I'll have to do it for the children's pastor that we, Lord God, willing will hire to say, here's what we as a church are doing. Here's where we as a church are heading. That takes a lot of work to crystallize and verbalize what we're thinking. And men, you and I sometimes were just, hey, you still friends with me? I'm almost done. I don't do this much. You know I don't do this much. We frankly, we find it hard to cast vision because then I have to have a singular focus between my work, my home, my church, and my hobbies, and I have to make them one singular focus. I have to decide whether family planning is God's business or mine. I have to determine if I'm supposed to be followed. Honestly, I'm not sure my wife, we think, sometimes we think this, I wonder if my wife will even respect my decisions in a day where people do not love their leadership, regularly and publicly question their leadership, berate their leadership on social media, and ruin the reputations of their leadership. Men, frankly, are reticent to lead anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be the job. It can be the corporate head. It can be the school board. By God, I'm an American. I'm going to say what I want. And we light them up. It is difficult to lead in this culture where we do whatever we want, whenever we want, and want the right to do it. But not only is leadership hard, fellowship is hard. I mean, this could go under number one, but a lot of ladies are struck with the idea that their husbands are either not saved or playing the game. And it's hard for them to submit to their husbands because they're not sure that their husbands are even walking with God. Consider the idea, friends, that our wives need to see us praying and meeting with God. Consider the idea that our wives need to hear us praying. Our wives need to hear us singing in the assembly of the saints. Our wives need to see us carrying our Bibles to church. Our wives need to know that when something hard comes up, we pray about it, yes? Followship is hard if you don't know which way you're headed. And also, if I can say, and this is probably the most obvious one to me, this is hard to, this is a hard thing. Help my husband with his life's mission. Why? Because when I read Proverbs 31, I see that a woman is very skilled and that she is, in a way, very independent. If you've never read Proverbs 31, the last 20 or so verses, it's a challenge. Even She is a domestic homemaker, and she is working hard outside the home at times, managing properties, getting up early, managing a household. And a lady who knows how to do this well is like, how does that even fit into my husband's mission? And I'm not saying I have the right answer. I'm saying that it's, in many cases, friends, two miles away from where we're supposed to be. How did this happen? Well, a mile at a time. A year here, a year there. Churches quit preaching on biblical ideals. The pastor was a coward. He was afraid half the people would leave. He was afraid he'd be called a cultist. He'd be afraid that he wouldn't be well received. He'd be afraid that his Christmas gift wouldn't be as big. Blah, blah, blah. And so we quit preaching on stuff that really needs to be talked about. Another reason why following men is hard is because abusive leaders are everywhere. 
They wonder if their husbands will abuse them with their so-called biblical authority or if their husbands will leave them defenseless, moneyless, jobless, school, you know, childless even. Will they try to take the kids and leave? How much faith should I have in this husband? So it's, it's difficult. And then, of course, there's more opportunities now than ever before for ladies to do exactly what their husbands are doing and sometimes better and sometimes getting paid better. Now, that, that is not bad news, friends. I'm trying to give you some hurdles to why we are two miles away from what God might have already designed. Now, if I were speaking to just men, I would say something else right here. But we're not just speaking to men. We better be real careful, gentlemen, about the biblical ideal for who makes us happy. This idea where I can window shop all I want, as long as I don't touch, that came right out of the pit of hell. So, third reason, then we're basically done. It's hard to lead, it's hard to follow, and thirdly, we have elevated many, many, many luxuries to necessities. We put ourselves in positions where we need more income than we would have ever needed in a different generation. This means we often have two missions in the home, two lifestyles to support them. I'm not picking on you if you have two incomes in your home. I'm not at all. I'm not picking on you if you're in a place where you have to do this. I am not saying, Christians, that you're doing it wrong. I'm saying that we should not be surprised that men and women who are Christians have a hard time dwelling together in the power of the Holy Spirit when we are not seeing the Genesis 2 reality where a man leads clearly, has a life mission, everything he does contributes to that mission, and God gave him a wife to help him with that. Friends, we're a long ways off from this. Well, what are we going to do? Pastor Bill, what are you going to do? You're going to start just preaching on this all the time? No, I wouldn't preach on it once at a time. But it's next. It's Ephesians 5. So what do we do, Christians? What do we do? Do we want to get back to the Garden of Eden ideal? Well, first thing we do is we realize that God had the right design, even if it scares us. Number two, we acknowledge that going about it our own way has left us with a measure of discontentment and can I just say a long, 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 long list of prayer requests that never get answered because most of them are hatched out of selfish choices. Thirdly, we acknowledge that we have the opportunity to creatively restore and carefully and deliberately redeem some of these God-ordained balances so that we can have homes that are ever increasingly, and oh boy, I'm sucking air right now. I don't even want to read this. <sighs> we acknowledge that we have the opportunity to creatively restore and redeem some of these God-ordained balances in our homes so that we can have homes that are ever increasingly husband-led, wife-aided, children-nurturing, parent-directed showcases of gospel realities, including, but not limited to, forgiveness, reconciliation, order, justice, love, sacrifice, and clarity. All of these were displayed by God, in Christ, and through Christ at Calvary. Let's all stand together, please. You've been very patient. And I appreciate it. Heads bowed, please. Eyes closed, please. We might have somebody, while the music is playing, that has something they need to pray about, and it has nothing to do with the sermon. And frankly, they are scared to death that if they come and pray, someone's going to think, oh, their marriage is a wreck. It might not have anything to do with the message. If you see someone come forward, brothers, sisters, let's not let them pray alone. If you need to be born again, right where you stand, you can put your faith in the work of Jesus. There's room for you in the family of God, and we want you. You might already be a church member. We want you in the family of God. You might be a tender. 
you might be a guest, you are wanted in God's family. I ask you to give us a few more minutes to pray, and I really do mean a few. Now, I'm not using preacher speak. If no one comes, we'll be done in two minutes. But we should not even have the preacher saying that kind of thing. This is God's work on the Lord's day. I don't know about you, but when I read the book of Genesis, I want my home to be more biblically ideal. More and more and more. I want to be easy to follow. I want to be the right kind of leader. I want to love my wife sacrificially. If you'd like God to be your father, put your faith in Jesus alone. While the music's playing, can you put up the previous slide? Everyone, please look at what's up on the screen if you can get to it. That's an article that was written in 1999. $125 million was spent on a Mars climate orbiter. If you can't read it, I'll read it to you. NASA lost a $125 million Mars climate orbiter because... Spacecraft engineers failed to convert from English to metric. It doesn't take much. My Lord and my God, thank you for these wonderful people. Thank you for Sandy Ridge Baptist Church. How thankful I am to be the pastor here. Frankly, you know I'm looking forward to getting on to a different passage. But the sermon has been delivered, the message has been delivered with great trepidation. And I thank you for your love for us. Dismiss us with your blessing. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You're dismissed.